Hey friends, my name's Stevie Taylor. Welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. My guest today is Chris Chetland. Chris is a multi-award winning, record-breaking audio mixing and mastering engineer, producer, studio and label owner from Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, I met Chris in 2012 when our band The Company won a New Zealand On Air Making Tracks grant for our song Two Bucks and um, we chose him to record, mix and master the song so um, they were good times indeed. On any different week you'll find at least two or three tracks or albums in the New Zealand music charts that Chris has worked on. His output is prolific, to say the least. Um, he also mixed and mastered Scribe's debut album, Crusader. Um, not many, if many. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, we chatted about his early days in the metal band, dance parties in the 90s, forming cog transmissions, digital streaming, the cultural renaissance currently being seen in the New Zealand music scene, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I won't waffle on anymore, so ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Chris Chetland. Cheers. I think we're rolling. Rolling. Chris Chetland, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. Kia ora. Kia ora, bo. Kia ora, bo. What's going on? What are you up to? Um, I'm having my dinner at the moment. Yep. Uh, it's been a long day, and I'm running behind on things. Hence, um, yeah, having some dinner. Yeah. Well, Other than that. <laughs> food's, right. food's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get pretty uh, after a day of working in the studio. Yeah. You get shattered. Yeah. So if you don't eat, if I don't eat, I'll probably start fading out and going off on. Even more random tangents than I usually would. Well, that might be that that might be fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what are you what are you working on at the moment? And then we'll um yeah we'll... um we're doing like a sixteen track album at the moment, but we're just doing a couple of days a week sing for that. Yeah, you know, we don't do we mainly focus on mastering, but we do the odd little you know projects of mixing. Um, yeah, this one particularly good because we're working with a guy Tim Skidden, who's really good writer and producer, and so he's worked with the likes of um, Op Shop, The Feelers, Babysitter Circus. So he's had like so many, you know, number ones and top tens, um, and he's a total freak in the studio as well as being entertaining. So um, yeah, we're just working on this project. Um, do it. We're just working on all the mixes at the moment, so yeah, it's it's intense because we're going into such big detail. But it's good because Tim can he can see things that virtually no one else sees, or you know, the, his vision on the pro is um, yeah, it's really impressive. So, yep. Um, what, what sort of style? Um, it's quite nineties influenced rock, um, primarily uh, with a bit of pop feel on this one um but yeah you know some of it's sort of more indie along the lines of pixies and breeders and some of it's just more rock uh, um you know straight rock um yeah but it's it, yeah it's cool it's, yeah we're really getting to try out a whole load of really cool techniques and then referencing back to stuff that you grew up with and seeing it often how um the mixes of stuff that you thought was so amazing at the time now just doesn't even really stand up to the modern production techniques available tricks that you can do. Uh, so referencing that and trying to pull in the best parts of that, but then add in all the modern aesthetics and then take it in its own direction. So it's, it's a unique thing. So it's pretty interesting. The, uh, the challenge that we really pretty 
shattered by you know after six hours which is um we're going pretty deep on it so usually you can work a bit longer than that but yeah six, six hours we're fine I don't so know, just, before we need just to on that lie down. yeah on that a little bit if you if you're sort of pulling up tracks that you thought sounded amazing back in the day and then mm. you're sort of comparing it to now how does it make you feel about that old track do you still you still kind of have that 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 original vibe with that track, or are you disappointed that it doesn't sound like it should sound today? Um, if you listen with just on the melodic content and the vibe of the track, then there's no difference. But if you put your modern production aesthetic and knowing what you can do with sound, um, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, it is just a um, a snapshot of that time and how they saw the world. So it's really interesting because you do learn a lot. Yep. on that but um it's if you like modern day drum production yep. has really just gone ballistic with yep. what you can actually do yep so um, is it is, so it, live, is it live drums live, live it's drums. live drum. we live did drum. it all with them yeah where they um roland was a td10 or td15 um and that just lets us do a whole load of other things that we wanted to do because a lot of the references also were bands that used drum machines as well so we decided to get a in you know a happy medium between it and using an electronic kit gotcha and it's fun so we're using like superior drummer is um yeah it's pretty good the kits on that so yeah we're not so worried about having a super um you know analog you know live kit yep. um sound on this uh because we're doing lots of production techniques on it as well. Yep. Due to its influences. So yeah. That's really cool. All right, yeah. man. Well let's um let's start rolling, rolling, rolling all the way back to where it begun. So um so where are you from originally? Were you born and raised? Um I was born and raised in, in Howick. Um which is in Auckland, middle class suburb. And um Grew up near the beach, so spent a lot of time down there. And uh, we had a farm across the road, so also on a f- you know running around, hanging out with animals or in the bush. Um, but it was also suburbs there, it sort of bridged quite nicely between nature and suburbs at the time. They just flattened everything and built houses over the whole lot, and it's uh, yeah, it's a bit sad going back there, but. Mm. Yeah, apparently it's progress. Yeah, <laughs> and when did uh when did music start? Start to um, I mean, I liked music as a um, as a teenager. Certain styles of music, particularly sort of more alternative, uh, industrial styles, gothy or punk. Um, so I was you know into Baja, Susie and the Banshees, Skinny Puppy were definitely one of my favourites. Front two four two. Um, on the more electronic side of that. They're probably one of the most influential <laughs> things. And started doing music with other people. Um, sort of, was it my, what my third year of year? What's that? So, I don't know, 90, in the early 90s anyway. Uh, so we had a, a band with a few friends um, doing having a go at doing music that was influenced by bands like Pop Will Eat Itself. Um, so crossing rock with electronic kinds of things. So we just um, played around in that and gradually, you know, did some gigs with that with varying degrees of lack of success. And um, then eventually was doing a gig um, and there was another band called Raw Meat from the Balcony that were playing there at the time. And they were use, they were a metal band and they were using backing tapes as well with samples on it. And they had some problems during their gig because their um, before sampler on cassette that they were using, it um, fell off partway through the gig off the drummer's little table. And I just went up and fixed it, you know, so it could still work. And yeah, chatted to them afterwards. They asked me to, join in because I had a computer that could do samples uh, and just do the samples live and, yeah, the sound effects. So just sort of developed through from there. In 96-ish, yeah, probably around then, um, 
95, 96, uh, moved into town into a uh, an old shoe warehouse. So it was all covered in old shoes. They made shoes for um, transgenders and and the general public. But they, they left a large amount of uh, transgender-sized si- shoes that obviously they'd got done but they hadn't been paid for or with test ones. So, um, yeah, it was pretty... Yeah, I don't know what happened then, but someone obviously <laughs> got them out of them. Um, <laughs> it was a terrible uh, mess, the whole place. So we built the studio and that just using um, wood that we got from um, demolition yards. Right. And just you know, to build and do it just with the idea of recording our metal album. And by that time, we were also we were doing electronic stuff a bit as well and got involved in that. And the electronic scene was really starting to... Um, develop and a lot of our friends were really into the electronic scene rather than the metal scene mm-hmm. so we were hanging out with them more and more the metal band we were in was also playing at dance parties mm-hmm. um, yeah so there was a really good and healthy interaction between the two genres right you know, i was gonna, I was yeah. gonna ask how that kind of how that kind of went down with the with the dance crew you know the well, especially drum and bass <laughs> drum and bass is just metal with electronic sounds all yep. the riffs are pretty much known um, there were a lot of people that ab- abjectly denied that, but they were the DJs rather than the musicians. The musicians were like, yeah, of course. And so many of the early electronic musicians, when I say early, the, of that particular wave that came through in the mid-90s, you know, they all came from metal bands. You know, a large percentage of them, probably well over half. So, um, yeah, so all the DJs were going, oh, no, nothing to do with metal. All the people actually writing, you know, the local electronic music. Um, we're still listening to metal as well as writing electronic music. So, yeah. That's cool. What sort of started to happen after that? Um, just because uh, we released some music and it went out and it was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So you got some cool points. Um, but there's no way we were going to survive doing that. We were all on the doll at the time. Um, just taking breaks from yeah having you know to be responsible um and find out you know just find out how to do what we were interested in doing at the time so we um yes we put out some music and it was accepted and people seemed to like it but it was going to take us too long to get paid from releasing it from distributors and all the standard things like six months, there was there was no way it was financially feasible. So the idea to do release parties where you got the CD, and the album on the night, so we could get rid of you know three to six hundred albums in a night, which means everyone got paid. I mean, yeah, we did that like every sort of month, sort of ended up being you know to six weeks, which destroyed us pretty much. But we got a whole lot of music out there. Um, in a short period of time, and it started a whole wave that people took seriously. New Zealand electronic music, because you know we were, we'd been told by you know high-level government, creative um, industry people <laughs> that New Zealand, you know, cre- electronic music had nothing to do with New Zealand culture, which is ridiculous when you consider people like Douglas Lilburn around, and it obviously did um, if you knew your history, but. Regardless of that, it was part of our culture now. So, um, yeah, we were dealing with all that. And then suddenly people realised that it wasn't going away and they started accepting it and we were doing really big parties. And, yeah, the media got interested and helped out a lot. And especially BFM, they were amazing. Right. So, um, yeah, just developed through from that and we got out of the artists coming in wanting to release music through as well. And then we did the Pitch Black album and that went gold. And yeah, just trucked through along those lines for a while. Yep. And had had Cog Transmissions formed at this stage? Yeah, Cog Transmissions yeah. was the name we used for the very first release. All right. Okay. All right. Which was December twelfth, nineteen ninety eight, maybe. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then and Cog Transmissions obviously grew quite a lot. Yeah. And so, um, at what stage did it start getting sort of a little bit too much? too much going on oh well before it even started oh really <laughs> it was ridiculous right. I mean, it's one of those things you do in your 
you know, um, like late 20, we go, yeah, you just keep on working ridiculously the whole time. And yeah, yep. the amount of work it takes to develop anything along those lines is ridiculous. I mean, I still do really long hours, uh, really massive hours every day. So, but it keeps you fit, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and this was still, was this analog still back then? It's to tape? It was, it was the early, no, no, no. We, all the cog was all done digitally. Mm-hmm. So we had like the early versions of Pro Tools or right. and bouncing it down to DAT. And, and, right. yeah, we never had a machine apart from a, you know, a four-track cassette one. Right. So we were the beginning of that sort of change or at the beginning of that sort of change. Right. Did you feel it changing? Did you realise that you you guys were kind of yeah like a little bit little bit ahead, bit of a step yeah ahead? Uh, yeah um, in some ways we were behind in other ways as you know because there were people doing other things but um, you have that confidence and like we're just going to do it regardless but yeah we could definitely see where it was going and even though lots of people were telling us no it's not going there we knew it was and it did <laughs> so. Yeah, and there are other things we had no clue on where they said it's going to go this way, and yeah. Yep. And h- how many people were involved in cog, cog transmissions at this stage? It depended on the year. They got up to quite a few. That, um, I think there were like at one stage 10 people there pretty much full-time. Right. And then various other people as well. So, yeah, that was terrible. Terrible idea. A lot of egos. A lot of egos, a lot of ideas. And yeah, yeah. Was there a um, – were you all sort of equal or, or was – did somebody have sort of final say and stuff? Um, it, it, it depended because you have different levels of interest. Oh, and, yeah, right. And so some people don't give a fuck and some people do. And so that creates its own form of hierarchy or distribution in relation to things happening. And if people are looking after a certain area, then they do thing. So yeah, it's like any organisation. And did, were you still at the at the, the the shoe warehouse at the stage, or had you sort of? Yeah, yeah. So we stayed. We moved out of the. Or I moved out after all the other the rest of the cog dissipated. Um, you know, to off to do its own things. I stayed on with the lease because the studios were there, and I was doing the studio out of it. Um, so it made sense. And in end of 2009, I got a PhD scholarship. So it was like, right, well, I'm not going to be traveling into town every day to work and, you know, having to spend all that time when I've got more than one focus. So we built a studio out on our section uh, next to the house so I could do both things. Yeah, so we say this was two thousand and yeah, uh, the end of two thousand and nine, I think it was. Yeah. But now I get to work at home, which is yeah, awesome. that's good. You don't have to commute. That's yeah, that's good. Yeah, I don't really like concrete that much as well. So going into town into the concrete was you know I totally had enough of it. It was just like no. We're really out in the trees, and um, you know, very few humans around. You know. Looking out from our house, it's about five hundred meters to another house. So, um, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I've been to your place. So I, I know. It's yeah, beautiful out there. Yep, really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we had a good time when we were there. It was really good. Yeah, really fun. We did. So you mixed and correct me if I'm wrong. Mastered Scribes. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Crusader album. Yep. Which was massive. Um, and sort of. It was sort of record breaking stuff, wasn't it? You want to talk a little yeah, bit? It's of- the new record holder for weeks of a single at number one. Right. Yeah, so, that's, yeah. That's, that's impressive. So, how did that come about? And what were those? What was that session like? Uh, it depended. I said it was fun working with P Money. He's entertaining in the studio. He keeps you laughing. Um, I got asked to do it because I, they thought I was the best person for the job who could get the best sound that I'd been working with P money on quite a few projects already. So I sort of knew the sound he was after. And, um, yeah, so just did that and the sessions came in various levels of organization. Sadly, the stand up track, when it got delivered to me, the logic session had corrupted. So all I had 
was a bounce down of the track, a stereo, uh, where they were last at, and a whole load of files called Audio 1, Audio 2, Audio 3, Audio 4. <laughs> so I had to completely reconstruct the entire track from uh, guessing which takes were what, just from unlabeled things. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's what that one was. That took a long time. I think it took a couple of days, two, three days. It took fucking ages anyway. Um, yeah, we ended up being their first number one, but it was just, yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah. You know. How was that? <laughs> how was that feeling? Having that. What hiring? Having that track sort of go to go to number one, and because that was that your no, you you'd had some number ones with some of your stuff. I've had various number ones and various things. It was like it was okay. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, oh, that's cool. That's that's cool. <laughs> like, yeah, that's number one. Whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, well, um, yeah, that's yeah. I just did the mix, <laughs> really. Yeah, so. right. Okay, you're a very humble, dude. Yeah. Cool. And um, did that sort of open up some opportunities to other stuff? Did y- yes, for certain things, but it also closed off doors for other things. Is that because the- people say, "Oh, Chris just, Chris just does hip hop," or oh, you sold, you sold out, you sold out from your. From your, um, yeah, oh, yeah, so the indie people were yep. yeah, from that side as well. And then other people said, oh, Chris just does hip-hop. So wow. it closed as many doors as it opened them. And it did take a good nearly seven years to um, yeah, to rework out of that. Right. So, yeah, you got to look at things from both sides. So it was, you know, it was nice having you know, the New Zealand record for things and having, you know, three number ones off that album. But... It definitely closes many doors that open them, right? Because you just get typecast as you know, Chris just does the person just does this, or right? That. And to get to get oh, you know, that, you know, yeah, yeah, commercial stuff. So yeah, you won't get them to do any indie, you know, indie guitar stuff, or right. And how did you did you um, have a plan to get yourself sort of to open reopen those doors? Um, you yeah, sort of consciously well, say, "Oh, let's let's seek out some some indie and sort of and go uh, look." No, no, I was really a bit lazy and didn't care enough. Okay. Um, yep. We just focused on advertising, doing advertising work. Okay. Because just after the Scribe album happened anyway was when copying happened. So suddenly CD sales just plummeted mm-hmm. over the period of six months or a year. So the budgets also plummeted by probably 80 90%. Right. You know, as people freaked out. So, and they're all doing it in their bedrooms. So we just focused on advertising and beast stuff for four or five years. Yep. Which was cool. You know, there was a lot of good, um, there was a lot of cool people we worked with and there were a lot of, yeah, it was, you know, telling clients they can't do lines of Coke in the toilets. Um, <laughs> yeah. You say, because you're just going to come here and talk at me and, you know, it's pretty hard to work while you're talking at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and clients just getting so fucking pissed at the stumbling. Okay, this is ad clients. Musicians are incredibly well behaved compared to ad clients, we found. Yes, <laughs> ad, ad clients throwing up in our toilets, dropping things, having getting into big screaming arguments, all sorts oh, of stuff. What? Yeah, but they, <laughs> uh, you know, the, this is the problem ones. The, the cool ones were amazing, but yeah, yeah the problem ones figured they were, with, you know, they were paying enough money they could uh, they yeah, act bad as people thought you know musicians cutting loose did so yeah it was weird but we, so we moved out of that side of things and, yeah we had enough by 2010 said so i started a phd um i've got a phd scholarship so just focused more on that side of things um because it's low stress <laughs> yeah advertising is weird <laughs> yeah so um were you doing the music for the for the ads, yeah, and you know, and sound you know, post design, you know, sound design and stuff like that. So, but yeah, it's a pretty cutthroat industry. So it was just like, nah, the vibe wasn't right. Right. Um, were you still having? Uh, we still getting um, regular musician type clients at that time, or had you? Yeah, just yeah. there was we were just juggling it between, but more of the in- income was coming from you know ad and TV stuff. And now we just sort of changed it back. 
um, well now, so most of the income comes from mastering or, you know, and then we do mix down, especially STEM mixing, yep. help people finish off their stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Mm. And you had a pretty big year last year in regards to the amount of yeah. sort of, uh, stuff that you played on that, that, uh, sorry, the stuff that you worked on that got awarded at the um, music awards. Yeah, it was ridiculous and i was hoping i'd get a, as a consequence you know i was hoping to get a bit of um time off over january to do gaming, but yeah it's just kept on going and i'm working on the really cool artists who stuff i just go wow they're so cool it's uh, um, real scary working with them because yeah. they're so what they do but they seem to like you know me helping out so yeah and i tell jokes so yep. that helps yep and you've um you do a fair bit of managing, too. No, I I, I co manage. Oh, so you co man you, you and you co manage your mentor. Could I should I say? Yeah. I, I like yeah. helping people out. Yep. Because I know how hard it was, and when we came through the music scene, especially with the styles of music we were doing, electronic and metal, no one really wanted to help us out or put time in, apart from a couple of little people. Grant Kearney, Sample G was amazing. George Ash from Universal, um, who's now head of Universal Australia and or Southeast Asia or whatever. He was amazing as well. Um, BFM were great, but there was a lot of industry, you know, pushback. And there also wasn't the, uh, it was really hard to try and find information on even how to do stuff. So, yeah, I like to help people out as much as I've got spare time, which is not much. Right. But we work with Ray, who's, uh, we got a co, a co label with, so we can, Pass of all the jobs we don't want to do to him responsibly. Um, <laughs> cool. and, yeah. Yeah. So we're just showing, teaching him how the industry works because he's cool and he's really talented and he works, does tracks in English and Te Reo Māori. So that's really interesting yep. um, from our side because I think it's sort of the most interesting aspect of New Zealand music in many ways at the moment is yep. that whole re, that cultural renaissance that's coming through Te Reo Māori music and the way that that can provide unique cultural accent or movement for New Zealand music overall. So I just think, yeah, it's just, it, that's just as exciting now as the electronic, you yeah. know, thing coming through in the late nineties, early two thousands was, or, you know, perhaps the hip hop thing was in the, you know, early mid two thousands. Right. Gotcha. That's cool. Yeah. The challenge to learn a whole load of, uh, words from a new language yeah. so that helps yep yeah uh, so yeah so we were I, we're teaching Ray to um you know just all the aspects of the industry and so we co-manage it he you know he's onto it he's got a degree in marketing in Tereo Māori so he knows what he's doing but I just pick him up and help with the things that my experience can give so commensal relationship nice that's really cool um talk a little bit about beta cell Beta Cell. Beta Cell. Um, it's one of your your own projects? Yes, it is. It's true. Yep. Those things are true. I do stuff as Beta Cell. Well, where, uh, where did Beta Cell start? Where did it begin? Was this back in the uh, COG transmission days? Uh, it was before that. It was 94, probably was the first. Um, the first gig would that have been that would have been December as well um yeah it was the name quickly because we had to on the stairs of one of the other guys who was in it at the time Dave Roper uh of his flat because he was putting on a gig he was interested in being a promoter he ended up doing things like subtronics and putting on lots of really big you know really important um fishy drum and bass gigs mm-hmm. um yeah so we started doing that as sort of ravey type electronic music as just something to do a bit more electronic from the metal stuff. That uh, was Pat and I, who was the guitarist of the band uh, for the balcony. So, yeah, we just did that and then went, dabbled in a bit of drum and bassy stuff and just mucked around on that. The actual first Beta Cell album came out probably 2004. That was after Pat had moved to Austria uh, to live. Uh, David left probably by 95. 
Uh, he was more interested in DJing and promoting. Right. So did that with as a sort of collaboration thing with Timmy Schumacher, and that was just all breaks. And yeah, that did quite well. It had the uh, was it Lay It Down single was the most played track on alternative radio in two thousand and two, and the following year, What's Down Low was the second most played. Uh, track alternative radio in New Zealand for 2003. So, yeah. That's cool. It went quite well and just at the height of it all, um, decided we decided to call it quits and, yeah, good rock and roll. Right. But it, it's come back a little bit because you've done – You've done some things. Yeah, I've been it. doing some stuff. Cause, yeah, it's fun to write music and it's, I'm more interested, especially in – doing stuff more on like the drum and bassy stuff, but also with using pretty much all live musicians. And then instead of using you know, standard singy type stuff, uh, doing it all in te reo Māori just for the challenge as a learning thing to learn more of the language, but also because no one else is doing it. I've got a studio, so, you know, might as well try and challenge myself and make it as hard for myself as I can. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, New Zealand on air making tracks scheme. Yeah, that's how we ended up um, meeting you. Because um, at the time um, I was in a band called The Company, and we presented a song called Two Bucks to to the Making Tracks panel, and um, you were on that panel. I was, and I really liked yeah, that. You really liked that track, and you sort of, yeah, and that's really cool. And then once we once we um, we heard that we 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 got the funding. I think did you you contacted you contacted one of us contacted Ronnie or you contacted me, and I was like, oh, cool, because that's a really cool track. What, Ronnie um, emailed me. Yeah, and that was cool. And then yeah, we um, because you know we're over in we're over in Sydney, so we had. To, we did some fundraising and and got over to New Zealand and we yeah. came out and met you and yeah and we went out to Revolver and did the drums eh we did we did with J- my friend Jason Shushkov and said yeah yeah yeah. yeah um yeah we did the drums and the bass out, and guitar out there mm, yeah. yeah we did a yeah. lot of it in the end yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 we did and it was oh man that was such a great time so are you still involved in the making tracks. About once a year, once every couple of years, I think I'm on a, a panel, but that's all I do. I just, you know, listen to a hundred or something tracks um, and then say which ones I, I like. Yep. So, I mean, it's been good because I've been um, managed to be, I was on the panel that gave the first ever um, funding to a Te Reo Māori track. Wow, awesome. Yeah, which was for Macy Rika Angaroa. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, and it's just it's just nice. And same for Alien Weaponry. I was on that one as well. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. Oh, didn't have and they doing yeah. well. Yep. So it's good thing being on that because you also at the end you get to present one, sometimes two tracks that you really like that haven't been voted in. So it was the case, same case with Macy's Tongue Raw one. And and uh, you get to present why you think it should have a, a grant. So they've got a really good process for that. It's really well thought out and it works really well to not just get tracks that are going to be obviously commercially viable for the particular stations, whether it be indie or, you know, pop, but also ones that from your experience you think this is going to fly. And like the Tangaroa one ended up having like probably a million streams. Yeah. Um, That video. Yeah, it's just nice to have got to help out on that and um you know convince people to take a punt on something that did end up being so successful yep um now still being on that panel um what what's the sort of quality of the music you're getting now what's the styles uh, i don't i haven't been on one for probably a year okay. um it's just it's really broad there's there's a lot of indie guitar type stuff singer songwritery not much electronic not much Urban generally, um, yeah, as in the sense of more rap. Uh, There's a bit of R and B that comes through. It's more yeah, pop and indie, and um, yeah, that's predominantly what comes through. It's, yeah, it, it, it does change every round, so it's hard to tell. I've only yeah, when you're on it every one or two years, it's pretty hard to um, provide a informative 
statistical analysis. <laughs> yeah, good answer. Um, now, your thoughts on streaming? Yeah, you know, just got to work out how to evolve into it. Does it pay less? And is it in many ways a negative for the industry? I think so. Because I know how much you used to be able to make, even as a bedroom artist. Um, yeah, you could easily make ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year in income as a bedroom artist by putting out a CD and you know your app for streaming and rap fund equivalent um, and the odd gig. There's no way you will do that these days. Um, yeah, so streaming pays nowhere near enough what it should, which means artists have to tour as their main income stream, which that's all good when you're in your 20s and you don't have kids, but you do, it, it does initiate a significantly higher drop-off rate amongst artists, which means that we're also losing a lot of experience uh, in the effective gene pool or the yeah, ecology of it all. Awesome. So um, it's good that streaming income is coming up now and oh, I think it, it is, right. yeah it, it, it got it's, it's past its worst point but so many people had to give up on their careers and so many studios had to shut down because it said you know when you suddenly over a period of a couple of years found that your budgets for albums dropped by say 80 percent um you know especially with the cost of studio gear when you think a reasonable eq is going to cost you you know close to two grand for one channel um yeah so it means it does move stuff over to digital, but yeah, the costs of running a studio are not significant at all. So um, yeah, we lost so many studios and amazing engineers that we shouldn't have lost. Um, and that was, yeah, one of the big functions was, well, it was primarily copying, but the replacement alternative streaming um, didn't do anywhere near as many favors as it should have done when you're talking about expenses to produce a project versus income. Yeah, you said that the um, the income sort of coming up, or the the price, you know, the the return is coming up a little bit. Is it on an upward slope? Will it keep? It is, seems is there, is that it's going to. We just got to work out where the limit factor is. Right. You know where the curve flattens. So because it's going to at some point. Yep. And um, yeah, it's. Yeah, that's the people that can advise on that are the, um, you know, record of music or the people that professionally work in those, that statistical side every day, they're more likely to. Um, now, I don't, I don't have time to really analyse that too much apart from reading their reports. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, f you think that's had an effect on the singles versus albums work that, that you get? Yep. Yeah, oh, it has. Okay. It does depend on genre, but um, urban music's moved to a very singles market and just boom, boom, boom. When you get enough tracks, yeah, you call it an, it an album. Okay. On the obvious, we're on a different aspect, the the folk, alternative folk type artists, they're all doing albums because they're doing vinyl at the same time, so they need to have an album. So it does depend on the uh, on the genre, but the more commercial something is, the less importance seems to be placed on an album. Let's just get a track out every six weeks or whatever, and just bang, 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 bang. and yeah. So, but you know, prog out prog bands, they're going to still keep doing concept albums, which is great because concept albums rule. Um, so yeah, it does depend on the genre, but it's not as important at all for certain genres to produce an album they can just keep on doing singles and as many as they can get out with as many artists as they can get out it's a numbers game right that's very interesting um now last year you got uh nominated for engineer of the year uh -huh, funny eh? yeah, yeah well, what's emotional. funny about that <laughs> well for one it was for a tereo. funny awesome it was for a tereo maori well there's, there's some more history right there yeah, well, that yeah it was in that year two of the three best engineer, um, uh, two, yeah projects were Te Reo Māori. Um right. So there's eight weaponries. Yep. One, and there was Ray's one. So and that's the first time ever there's been a Te Reo Māori project in the best engineer category. 
Right, right. So, yeah. And Alien, uh, Tom Larkin, wasn't it? He engineered Tom Larkin, it? Simon yep. Holloway. Yep, yep, yep. No, congratulations to you both, or to all of you. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a, or did have, or um, I don't know if it's still there, but you had your gear shootout group. Yep, it's still yep. there. It's still going? Yep. 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 Do um, you want to talk a little bit how that sort of came about and – um, um, yeah, the main reason for gear shoot was, especially being in New Zealand, when you want to find out what some gear sounds like, yep. you can't get hold of it. And Sorry, you can't, can, let alone can, compare it. Can you just give a, a quick description of what I, sh- I should have done that when I introduced the gear shoot out? Quick, just quickly tell people what that is. Yeah, gear shoot's a site that lets you compare audio gear and plugins against each other. It's fully calibrated. So basically we've made things called reference standards that you can compare them in real time, high speed switching between them so that you can decide which one works best for your ears and also break down a whole lot of myths. Um, so from my side, being in New Zealand, you want to get a piece of gear or try out three pieces of gear, but there's no way you can get a hold of three particular pieces of gear and spend the time shooting them out, let alone setting it all up. It takes ages. So we decided to do that at a site that would let us do that and also so I could compare later on whether this new piece of gear or you know what it sounds like compared to various other ones and what's the best bang for buck. So, um, yeah, and me coming from a science background, I got frustrated by people making claims about particular pieces of equipment that there was no evidence to back up that claim. My other thing apart from doing music is I'm a a managing editor for a theoretical biology journal. Mm -hmm. And so with that, it's all peer reviewed by, you know, people with PhDs and stuff, and it's all got to be done to a proper level. Any claim you make gets verified and run through. But there were people saying things about leads or compressors or, you know, various pieces of audio equipment and it was like that's just not true at all I don't reckon it doesn't make sense from my understanding of how sound works or physics works or how the gear works so by sampling all these things in we could do an actual comparison and find out if they were right or not yeah but it's also yeah useful as a resource for people to you know if they want to buy gear yeah if they want to check out which plugin is the best one to buy yep they can go in and compare to three or four other the ones because yep. you know no one in the music industry have, has a lot of money so so if you're going to invest 300 us in a plugin you better make sure that you really do like it compared to other things so yeah if you want to say compare three or four different uad plugins or three or four waves plugins when they're on special instead of you having to load them up into your door find a sample do all the settings make sure it's calibrated which is not a small amount of work you can just lo- go onto our site grab the ones we've already done it for, load them up and then shoot them out in real time and decide which one works best for your ears. Because some people like, you know, FET compressors, you know, and they'll always choose those. Some people like opticals. You know, I really like opticals a lot of the time. But there's different tones for different jobs. So you use a DBX160 for a particular sound or an 1176 for another one. And being able to actually realise why you do that, quickly and you need to be able to switch between samples really quickly less than 200 milliseconds really gotcha. otherwise your brain internal eq adjusts and you've got no useful form of analysis right so yeah so if anyone for example say they're testing leads or one piece of gear or another and they're playing it and then they're unplugging it and plugging another one in yeah you know, as soon as they're over 0.2 of a second it's all shit pretty much unless it's really fun how did you how did you work that out like that's what i'm actually trained in yeah, that's that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I work with academics, you know, for my um, my biology thing, and you know, so they're doing hardcore maths and analysis and scientific method on stuff, and yeah, I mean, that's the world I come from. That's cool, man. So I'll link the um, I'll link that in the show notes, the the gear shootout, as well as your your website and any other sort of stuff. Um, we'll start to wrap it up. Um. Any sort of last uh, messages or thoughts or? Right. Uh, what's useful to know? Uh, 
there's never a shortage of talent, but there's always a shortage of hard work. That's a good one, especially these days, eh? Fuck yeah, yeah, you can do so much, but yeah, it's just that, you know, if you're doing, and if you're doing things like engineering, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, it's just like being a performance athlete. You've got to be doing it as many hours and living, breathing and thinking it just to get your brain attuned to that level of delicacy or subtlety in the movements that you can do things that other people can't do. And that's why you do get things like, you know, people like mastering engineers or mix engineers or, you know, recording engineers to come and maybe just oversee one or two aspects of it or, you know, stem mixing is a popular thing. We do a lot for that where people get it as good as they can. And they send it to me and I'll spend a couple of hours on it and go just adjust a few things, change the feel um, sonically just to bring out the best in it. So, yeah, so, it's like, you know, you run as fast as you can and then you tag in someone who runs all you know six hours a day or trains you know six hours a day and get them to finish off the race for you you know that's kind of <laughs> that was kind of the the how it ha- how it worked with my ep and you because you mixed well, sorry you mastered my ep and plus gave me a lot of advice along the way but that was that was definitely the case <laughs> and and um yeah i know what you mean about having to keep doing the work because i haven't sort of touched that stuff for a while and and yeah it's, just, it's, 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 yeah. it's exactly the same as fitness. You know, it's, if you're, you know, playing rugby, touch rugby, um, you know, six, you know, you know, uh, let's say you go once a week for two hours. How do you think you're going to go up against someone who's doing touch touch rugby from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. every day? Exactly. It's like, and that's okay. So that's why you get them, you know, so... Yeah, yeah, that's why your team. All right, Chris Chetlin, hear those kids screaming. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being on the Gig Life podcast, man. I, I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, Thanks for having been, me. Nice to hang yeah. out and chat. Yeah, it's been good to talk again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, all the best. Um, until we talk again. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Man. Cheers, Chris. Takite. Right. So later, bro. See ya.
と記憶うわうわ書きてあって終わってはいてはいえとていい